This is Box Ridge. Just over here is a cemetery, a cemetery for the dead. And what Bishop Davies has called a cemetery for the living is all around us. On this one heap alone, there are the remains of more than 2,000 kangaroos shot over the past few months. And in the trees out there, the mulga and coolabar trees, are scores of crows just waiting for me to step off this heap so they can rejoin the flies in picking off what's left on the bones. Now they have wage equality, the next big step, of course, is social equality. But this one is by far the biggest. Meanwhile, this war continues. A Viet Cong rocket came through here about four hours ago, it destroyed this classroom, and it's the fourth time that this school building has been hit by rockets. Probably all of them have been aimed at the nearby United States Embassy and other government ministry departments which are located here. Uh, two rockets landed in Saigon this morning. This time, fortunately, nobody was hurt. And I think the speed with which the debris here has been cleaned up uh, indicates to quite some extent the acceptance of these people, of this sort of thing. Last night, we were eating in a restaurant and there were pistol shots outside. None of the Vietnamese inside took any notice of, at all. And it's this acceptance by these people of uh, all these conditions which is so puzzling, but then I suppose the ordinary people of Vietnam don't really have much choice. It's certainly true, Jerilderie is a friendly place, eager to show its best side to the visitor. And its best side is very attractive, but there are some skeletons in the cupboards of the town like the rather high number of extramarital intrigues in a community of just under a thousand, and the shotgun weddings, and the girls who leave town for a few months, returning after the unhappy experience of arranging for their baby's adoption, or the grapevine, which makes sure that everybody's business is somebody else's and gets its intelligence rather tangled at times. It was here two years ago in this Brisbane suburban house, decorated in the DLP colours of black and gold, where Mrs. Sheila Birchley composed her famous lines to the music from the Chocolate Soldier, the song My Hero. The occasion two years ago was the 40th anniversary of Senator Vincent Gare's years in the political arena. In this momentous week, we've returned to Brisbane and asked Mrs. Birchley to revive those famous words to that music so that once more we can hear the song in praise of Vincent Gare. I've burned my way through a quarter of a million of these things. The odd thing about it is that after 20 years and after a quarter of a million of them, I don't enjoy smoking. I don't smoke because I like it. I smoke simply because I'm an addict. Ever since Captain Cook hitched up his pantyhose and stepped ashore at Botany Bay, the image of the Australian male has been the subject of controversy. And, of course, the image has nearly always been misleading. Ned Kelly, for example. He's been, alternatively, hero or homosexual, but never a somewhat boring Victorian crim. And so, too, overseas, the Australian image has essentially been one of a people who are part of a, a wide brown land. The people whose... Uh, Faces are like Bert Tucker's, and they have the lightning repartee of Chips Rafferty. As I've said, are people uh, living in harmony with a harsh and beautiful landscape. And somehow, the man who's we're coming to here, who's been most responsible for Australia's image overseas, has managed to uh, convince everyone that the quintessential Australian character lies somewhere between the wombat and the wobble board. I'm coming to a stage now where I'm, I'm sick of rabbit meat and dandelions. I'm sick of going on the beach and hurting my feet every time I walk on the pebbles. I'm sick of smelling all the while and other people smelling. In fact, come to think of it, I'm sick of talking to the camera as well. A boy born in Adelaide 17 years ago. 
it became obvious when he was about three that he was retarded. He moved to Sydney with his family, went to a special school, joined a special cub pack. A nice boy. His name's Richard. He's my son. I thought I ought to tell you that, to declare my interest, as it were. I'll do my best, but it's hard to be entirely objective. The Sandinistas are an army, but they're a people's army. They have 25,000 soldiers, regulars, another 50,000 people from all over the countryside, students, doctors, people in the city, who come out here to fight. This part of the Philippines is a frontier, a wild land, a war zone. And even if the government and the Australians are trying to play down the extent of the war, there's still a lot of killings going on around here. I've seen animals in Australian feedlots better treated than these people. I really don't understand how it is that we can walk amongst them with our cameras and film them as they wait patiently to die and they protest not at all. I really don't understand how it is that we can travel halfway around the world and we can film all this and we can do it successfully, but we can't successfully give them the food that they really need. President Marcos gone. President Marcos gone. It's 9.15 on Tuesday night. President Marcos is gone. We're on the edge of the palace. We're in a kind of a no-man's land. Aquino supporters are coming in and they're exuberant. Down this end of the street, there are KBL supporters. The Aquino people describe them as Marcos goons. They're armed with stones and sticks. They think they're defending the president. They think he's still inside. It's 6.30 at night here, Fiji's first night under army rule, and the army is very much in control of everything here. We've just been told that the former Prime Minister, Dr Bavandra, and his ministers are being brought here to the Prime Minister's residence. As we understand it, they'll be held under house arrest here. It was here in the Cook Islands that Bond Corporation last year made 90% of its profit, $250 million. And you may think that's rather remarkable, because one of the things you notice about this place is there are no TUIs ads on the television, there's no Bond airships flying around over your head, and you can't even buy Bond beer. In fact, there's no sign of Bond Corporation at all. What's more, if you look at the annual report of the company, it lists 65 operating addresses of Bond companies, and not a single one of them is here in the Cook Islands. Young Warwick came home with two new religions. At Oxford, he was converted to Christianity, and at Harvard, to debt. Among the mourners here at his father's funeral were his half-brother, half-sisters, an adopted brother and sister, and his father's three wives. The Fairfaxes were a distinguished but complicated family. They seemed united in mourning, but in fact, this was the last day they've ever been together, because young Warwick was about to bring the plans for the succession completely unstuck. The most gruesome testimony to the worst excesses of the security forces turned up here, in the morgue at Bougainville's major hospital. Body after body was brought in, showing the signs of brutal torture before death. Our story tonight will take you into a netherworld, a world inhabited by criminals and police. We'll show you how the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption approved the attempted bribery of a detective and then bungled the operation. This is the beginning of our fourth full night on the road since leaving the Sudan. In that time, we've covered less than 300 kilometres. There are constant mechanical breakdowns. Tyre changes like this one happen 20, 30, even 40 times during a single trip. This really ought to be a strong lifeline for the needy. As it is, it's more like a fragile thread. I've seen so many bodies today, I just, I just couldn't count you can't think. Uh, I've seen pictures of the Holocaust, but I never thought I'd actually be inside one. You just pass piles and piles of bodies. Sometimes they're, they're wrapped neatly, hands and feet, little hands and feet. You certainly notice the little ones. Our vehicle just 
contributed to the carnage. A little child ran in front of the truck. That's what's going on behind us. It's very, very hard to, to comprehend what it's like to be here. It's, it's very, very hard to be here. I couldn't really think of what to say and it seemed like a bit of a cop out at the time, but I said, well, that's for your community to sort that out. 20 years later, when I come back to the story, the reports have been written, some services and some shelters have been provided, but the situation for Aboriginal women like that isn't better, it's worse. So what happens after the tsunami? Will Aceh once again become a closed off, war-torn province? Its military and civilian elite bloated by billions of aid dollars? Or could this terrible disaster provide a new beginning for the people of Aceh? It was then that the killings began. The soldiers went house to house. Anyone suspected of supporting the insurgents was shot on sight. A military source told the team of UN investigators who later travelled here that the soldiers were under orders to shoot at anything that moved. At three o'clock, a hundred or so MPs and senators ran the gauntlet of an expectant media. Do you think that they'll be uh, back in Christmas? I think we're pretty optimistic. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you right. off. Right. The committed and the recalcitrant converging on the party room. And they all know what's at stake, not the leadership directly, not today, but who and whose ideas will dominate the Liberal Party and its policy on climate change. 